Greetings everyone and welcome to another Eye on Africa. My name is Awasar. I'm Assistant Director for Academic Affairs at the African Studies Center at Michigan State University. Eye on Africa is our weekly seminary series. Uh, we're very happy today to have Dawson McCall as our guest speaker. So before I pass the floor to him, so a brief introduction. Dawson McCall is a visiting assistant professor of history at Loyola University, New Orleans, where he teaches courses on African history, sports history, and global history. His research focuses on the relationship between sports, education practice, and ideas of development in post-colonial Kenya. He is currently finishing his PhD dissertation entitled Run, Play, Read Educational Practice, Kenyan Sport and Community Development at St. Patrick's High School in Eten, in which he explores the social history of St. Patrick's High School in Eten, Kenya. He is a former Fulbright Fellow and an award-winning teacher and coach. Thank you very much, uh, Dawson, for being here. And now the floor is up to you. Wonderful. Um, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Saar. Um, and uh, real quickly, just before I get started, um, I just wanted to say thank you um, to the African Study Center, um, Dr. Saar, and everybody involved in organizing this weekly event uh, for allowing me to present today. Um, I've seen many of these over the course of my six years associated with MSU, and it's nice to be on this end and have something hopefully productive and constructive to, to say today. Um, it's also nice to see a few familiar names out there in the in the uh, um, uh, attendance. Um, so for everybody who uh, haven't been able to been able to see face to face the last few years, it's nice to at least cross paths virtually a little bit. Um, so um, the story that I would like to share with you today uh, begins in central Kenya in May of 1967 uh, with a group of high school runners who um, gathered to compete in the Kenyan Boys National Secondary Schools Cross Country Championships. This annual meet, which at times during the 1960s and 1970s included athletes who would go on to represent Kenya in major international competitions, was the culmination of a high school cross country season that had come to be known by many in Kenya as, quote, the backbone of Kenya's track successes. For aspiring Kenyan student athletes, sporting events such as this were an opportunity to make a name for themselves in a newly independent nation in which notions of development and social, social mobility had become central to national discourses. For the schools involved, it was an opportunity to brand themselves as centers of prestige and excellence in order to attract students and gain the support of their local communities, national government, and international benefactors. For national sports officials, it was a chance to groom future athletes who might go on to represent Kenya on the global stage offered by elite international athletics competition. With a record entry of over 460 student athletes from more than 50 schools, the 1967 event was held at the prestigious Alliance High School in the town of Kikuyu near Nairobi. As one of 52 schools in attendance that day, St. Patrick's High School, an all-boys Catholic school from the small West Kenyan town of Itin, was competing in its first cross-country meet of the season. Although a new school founded only six years earlier in 1961, the St. Patrick's athletes were confident, as one of them wrote in the school magazine that year, that victory would put them, quote, clearly and distinctly on the map in post-colonial Kenya. This kind of faith and competitive achievement as a gateway to national prestige was not an outlier in 1960s Kenya. Throughout the decade, as sporting success became a way for newly independent Africans to project positive images of themselves, their communities, and their nation states, Kenyan athletes gained global attention as they emerged onto the international track and field scene, establishing a tradition that has made the country synonymous with competitive running achievement and sporting success. In this context, competitive achievement was an important symbol for many Kenyans of what had come to be known throughout the 1960s as harambe, a Kiswahili term meaning let's pull together, that was used to evoke notions of nation building, post-colonial development, and Kenyan unity. St. Patrick's dominated the 1967 schools cross-country championships with form two student Paul Charap, pictured here on the screen, running barefooted 
winning the five mile senior race in a time of 25 minutes and 25 seconds. A stout time on what was described as a tough course filled with quote, marshy and swampy terrain. Other team members, Joseph Kamau, Alfred Chepkoyo, James Kiplagat, Limo Chalau, Kimutai Boit, Jacob Ruto, and Luca Chebiego were not far behind, running well enough to help the team win the overall championship. Helping to solidify the school's stellar performance, the junior team notched a third place finish, making St. Patrick's the only school to place in the top three of both the junior and senior divisions of that year's championships. In the minds of St. Patrick's students, the victory not only made their classmates national champions, but also school heroes who represented, quote, the brightest star of the school year and allowed the St. Patrick's community, as one student wrote in, the, in a student magazine, quote, to look forward to 1968 with hope, hope perhaps that some of us could go another 1500 feet higher to Mexico City, a reference to the upcoming Olympic Games slated to be held in Mexico in October of 1968. Victories like those of Paul Chirap and his 1967 cross-country teammates helped to establish a reputation for sports achievement that would make St. Patrick's one of Kenya's most well-known high schools and buttress an institutional identity that prized competitive achievement as a cornerstone of the school's culture. According to Mike Boyt, a classmate of Chirap's who would go on to win a bronze medal at the 1972 Munich Olympics and who would also later become the first Kenyan Olympic medalist to receive a PhD. Quote, to be a student from St. Patrick's always meant to rise above everyone else. It was very prestigious to be a St. Patrick's student and made you behave in a different manner from the others. Sentiments such as this were representative of a broader institutional culture, linking the identity of the school with competitive achievement, Harambe development, and the school's broader social educational mission. For Harris Mungai Kamau, editor of the school magazine in 1967, the school's traditions of achievement were intended to create an environment in which, quote, future generations would enjoy fruitful academic and social education to support the spirit of Harambe. During the 1960s and 70s, St. Patrick's became a space which linked students to these aspirations of competitive achievement and broader notions of Kenyan Harambe while also reflecting an educational practice that saw sport as a central component of student formation and campus social life. At St. Patrick's, notions of Harambe were both re reproduced and transformed by students, faculty, and staff, laying the basis for a vibrant, social, academic sporting life that has defined the school's identity and educational practices ever since. And at the same time, the creation of a unified institutional identity did not emerge without challenges. During the school's founding decade, students challenged the status quo through a number of organized and spontaneous actions. These challenges took the form of major conflicts, such as physical confrontations between students and religious teaching staff, and student-led strikes aimed at improving the school's curriculum and academic resources. They also included the quotidian attempts by students to carve out extra time after lights out in the dormitories or to sneak off campus to enjoy a mandazi, a cup of chai, or perhaps partake in a little busa, which is a locally brewed beer. All of this suggests that in early post-colonial Kenya, identity building was a con contested project in which individual aspirations and group goals did not always align seamlessly but were connected through a continual process of negotiation, conciliation, and creativity. Despite these contestations, throughout the 1960s and early 1970s, notions of achievement would be the pillar of an educational practice at the school that sought to form its students into achievement-oriented citizens. This practice, which saw the embodied education offered by sport as central to student formation, resulted from a cosmopolitan environment through which members of the St. Patrick's community saw themselves as participants in local, national, and transnational networks of educational and sports development. Interviews conducted with former St. Patrick students and staff, documents collected from personal papers in the school's campus museum, and articles published in the Kenyan National Press provide clear evidence of this achievement-oriented school culture the rich life it engendered at St. Patrick's, and the links forged between ideas of Kenyan Harambe and the school's identity. 
At the same time, while the efforts of St. Patrick's students and staff to promote this spirit were inspired by a genuine commitment to shape independent Kenya, they were not simply the functionalist outcome of post-colonial nation building. They were also motivated by individual self-interests, personal dreams, and the visceral, visceral exuberance of youth. As a result, during Kenya's founding decade, St. Patrick's became a tangible manifest, manifestation of the spirit of Harambe, championed throughout the country, while also providing a space in which members of the school's community could express and embody their own agency and ideas about what it meant to contribute to the project of Kenyan nation building. By demonstrating the ways in which students, teachers, and staff at St. Patrick's adopted and adapted ideas of Harambe development to inform the school's educational practices, this paper emphasizes the ways Africans in early post-colonial in the early post-colonial period sought to negotiate development practices, especially with regard to education, schools, and sports. The case of St. Patrick's demonstrates that while the Kenyan state was very successful in defining the rhetoric underpinning broad notions of Harambe, it was largely individual Kenyans and local Kenyan communities which conceptualized, experienced, and practiced this development, especially as it related to education and sport. For many Kenyans, Harambe became a national political slogan on June 1st, 1963, the day Kenya attained internal self-government. After a decade of intense anti-colonial military and political struggle, newly elected Prime Minister Jomo Kenyatta gave one of Kenya's most well-known speeches, calling the country to remember that self-rule was just one step on the road to Uhuru, or independence. In addition, Kenyatta unveiled what would become Kenya's most popular post-colonial nation-building slogan, saying, quote, as we celebrate, let us remember that constitutional advance is not the greatest end in itself. We must work harder to fight our enemies of ignorance, sickness, and poverty. I therefore give you the call Harambe. Let us work together for our country, Kenya. Kenyatta returned to the Harambe theme six months later on, Uhuru, on Kenya's Uhuru Day, speaking to over 200,000 Wananchi, Kenyan citizens, as he warned of the potential for complacency with the coming of independence, arguing that decades of repressive colonial rule or arguing that after decades of repressive colonial rule, the country had to redouble its efforts to overcome the triple enemies of ignorance, sickness, and poverty. To address these ills, Kenyatta said, Kenyans had to quote, work together to develop the country in the spirit that he was asking them to echo, Harambe. Throughout the 1960s and 1970s, this term and its associated values of unity, hard work, discipline, cooperation, and self-help became the mantra by which national leaders sought to define Kenya's national character. In response, many Kenyans took up the call of nation building in order to make the promises of development tangible in their own lives. These sentiments took many forms from grassroots movements of entrepreneurship and the implementation of development schemes known as Harambe projects to the promotion of elite athletic achievements and the organization of transnational scholarship programs aimed at training young Kenyan politicians, scholars, scientists, and business leaders. As Wangari Mathai, Nobel laureate and founder of the Green Belt Movement would later write in her autobiography, Kenyans during this time felt a deep sense of pride at being a Kenyan and were, quote, ready to join in the building of their newly freed country. At the same time, I'm sorry, one of the images doesn't seem to have appeared. Um, I apologize for that. At the same time, the unification achieved through Harambe political rhetoric, development schemes, and popular culture had its limits. From the onset of independence, the Kenyan government found itself enmeshed in a, quote, low intensity war known as a shift to conflict, a struggle between the new Kenyan state and the coalition of Somali, Boran, Gabra, and Rendile separatists in the northern region of the country. The shift to conflict lasted for four years and resulted in the forced resettlement of Somali communities into constructed villages, violence against civilians by the Kenyan army, and the deaths of at least 2,000 shift to rebels. In addition, the early years of independence saw protests of unemployed workers on the streets of Nairobi chanting slogans such as Uhuru Natabu, which means freedom and suffering, as well as an army mutiny at the Lenette Barracks where soldiers protested low pay and a continued pre British presence in the Kenyan military. 
high profile assassinations of nationalist leaders such as Pio Gama Pinto and Tom Boya further demonstrated the profound disputes that lay beneath the Harambe project during the 1960s. While these examples serve as reminders that post-colonial Kenyan nation building was, a, was at times a deeply contested and violent process, during the first two decades of independence, many Kenyans saw the notion of Harambe as a symbol of development. And as Kenyatta told members of the 1964 national team before they departed for the Tokyo Olympics, as a way to show that, Ken, that the Kenyan model of Harambe could be an example to the rest of the world. Indeed, notions of Harambe and the values of communal unity, discipline, hard work, and cooperation that have often been associated with it have historical continuities with pre-colonial Kenyan communities. The word itself is thought to have originated along the East African coast and then carried in when, by traders and porters from Mombasa, Malindi, and Lamu, used to signal a coordinated effort to accomplish a difficult task. Terms with meanings similar to the communal unity and cooperative self-help connotations of Harambe can be found in a number of Kenyan languages, including Luo, Luya, Kukuyu, Maasai, and Kamba. In addition to these linguistic commonalities, pre-independence traditions of self-help constituted grassroots systems of labor exchange and other forms of reciprocal communal assistance. Among Kamba communities of Kitui, for example, Mutual self-help took the shape of local help groups utilized for crop weeding, bush clearing, harvesting, threshing, small construction projects, as well as the collecting of building materials and firewood. Oftentimes, these projects would be accompanied with ceremonies of, uh, of celebratory dancing, feasting, and praise songs. Usually, um, oh, excuse me, post-colonial Harambe rhetoric drew from this long-standing indigenous system of social exchange of labor promoted by reciprocal forms of cooperative self-help. While the values underpinning Harambe linked the term to historical indigenous practices, the actual shape of Harambe development practice in post-colonial Kenya would mirror projects instituted by the British colonial state. These projects, which saw the introduction of terms such as development and the coercion of African workers through the use of forced labor emphasized large-scale efforts such as the construction of cattle dips, community terracing projects, latrine digging, road construction, and land reform efforts. Defining development as large-scale socially oriented projects would carry over into, into independence as most post-colonial Harambe projects took similar forms. The continuities between colonial concepts of development and the practice of Harambe development demonstrates both the transnational roots and the legacies of colonial policy in the development practices of independent Kenya. A third component, the unity component of post-colonial Harambe, perhaps the most consistent underlying concept, also has its roots in the late colonial period, emerging as an anti-colonial call for African unity during the 1950s. According to a Nyanza-based Kenu party secretary named Jay Owino Umbudo, the Harambe term was first utilized as a call to African unity, not by elite leaders such as Jomo Kenyatta, but by a local Nyanza-based organizer and Kenyan activist named Omolo Ongiro. Often referred to as nickname Omolo Harambe, Ongiro would begin anti-colonial rallies during the early 1960s with a call to Harambe and would lead protesters in singing expressions of African objections to colonial land policy and the colonial imprisonment of leaders such as Kenyatta and others. The genesis of the Harambe slogan and the actions of local organizers such as Omolo Ongiro reminds us that Harambe was born in the context of oppositional politics mounted by the oppressed in colonial Kenya, marking the term, to a certain degree at least, in a grassroots expression of African unity. After independence, Harambe rhetoric would draw from and combine all three of these distinct traditions, local and long-standing African concepts of unity and self-help, conceptualizations of development as large-scale social projects, and calls to African unity promoted by political leaders and local activists. In the post-colonial era, these three historical trend or threads would be combined and expanded to promote a distinctly Kenyan notion of development under the Harambe banner demonstrating the ways African leaders turned some of the, quote, assert assertions of colonizing powers, as Frederick Cooper has put them, into their own mobilizing ideologies 
and the ways in which Kenyans actively drew from local, national, and transnational sources in the practice of development. In addition, it is noteworthy that Harambe as a development ideology was never precisely defined in post-colonial Kenya. Instead, leaders and nationalist supporters relied on a rhetoric linking broader social, political, and economic goals, such as development, freedom, self-reliance, and unity, with popular catchphrases, such as hard work, sacrifice, cooperation, and discipline. The combination of these malleable values and expansive history were often promoted as representing something that was often referred to as the spirit of Harambe, and linked to the belief that development and Harambe existed anywhere there was a group engaged in a common task aimed at development. Nowhere are these ideas and characteristics on display more than in Kenya's rapid expansion of school construction in the 1960s. One representative expression of this can be seen in the nation's first national study of education, the 1967 Ominde Commission report, which surveyed the country's education system and set out a series of recommendations and objectives for the direction of the nation's schools. Chief among these objectives were an emphasis on secondary education as the primary means by which, as the report quoted, to foster the psychological basis of nationhood. In order to accomplish these goals, the report endorsed a number of tactics, including the incorporation of flag raising assemblies in schools, the creation of dramatic celebrations of Kenya's cultural diversity, the hiring of teachers charged with promoting loyalties that are, quote, the stuff of nationhood, and the implementation of a curriculum designed to teach science, arts, agricultural training, English as a primary language of instruction, and instill what it referred to as an African way of thinking about history. In addition, schools were meant to restrain what the report referred to as an excessively competitive spirit in our schools, traits which were thought to be incompatible with traditional beliefs. Between 1963 and 1972, in the first decade after independence, the number of secondary schools in Kenya increased tenfold. Most of this growth came in the form of what, we, what were known as Harambe schools, organized and funded through local funding, local fundraising efforts led by parents, churches, teachers, civil society organizations, and local communities. By the end of the 1960s, over 60% of all secondary schools in Kenya were the product of this type of Harambe effort. These schools offered key benefits for Kenyans. For example, they provided increased schooling options for a large number of citizens, while also demonstrating a strong and innovative civil, innovative civil society. At the same time, Harambe schools had higher tuition and school fees compared to government-funded schools, and the quality of education as measured by qualified teachers, class sizes, resources, and test scores was lower in most Harambe schools compared to government funded institutions. In addition, while the expansion of Harambe schools improved the potential for upward mobility, it also promoted a faith in an educational meritocracy and buttressed the idea that competitive achievement should be a central plank of Kenyan education. All of this demonstrates that in early post-colonial Kenya, notions of Harambe, national development, and schools were intimately linked in both the minds of political leaders and a number of Kenyan citizens. Harambe rhetoric and policy pulled from ideals, values, and practices rooted in both the indigenous African past, transnational colonial policies, and local activism. While the record, rhetoric and language of Harambe was largely defined by national leaders, actual practices of Harambe especially in how they intersected with education, were shaped by the ways in which individuals, groups, and local communities defined their own understanding of development. In such a context, the ideas and values linked to Harambe resonated tremendously at a school such as St. Patrick's. Although founded before the emergence of Harambe as a national developmental rhetoric in 1961, from the time it opened its doors, the values that would come to underpin the spirit of Harambe would play a powerful role in the lives of St. Patrick's and its school community. The diverse array of students, staff, teachers, and administrators that found their way to the school during its early years shared a faith in the importance of education, sport, and competitive achievement as a means for individual development, fostering a common understanding of the school's purpose and creating a distinct and exceptional learning experience. 
At its founding, the St. Patrick's administration and teaching staff consisted of two Catholic priests, Father Finn McDonald and Father Aidan Serlis. Members of the St. Patrick's Missionary Society from Kiltegan, Ireland, both McDonald and Serlis had taught in Kenyan intermediate schools for several decades before being transferred to St. Patrick's. However, both of them lacked experience in secondary school administration. Fenton McDonald took note of this when after taking control of the school, he noted in his diary that he took control with, quote, not a small amount of trepidation and trust in God in St. Patrick. In order to learn a little bit about the job, McDonald toured two of Kenya's well-known secondary schools, Capsabet, high, Capsabet Boys High School, a government-run school, and Mangu High School, a Catholic school run by the Holy Ghost Fathers. In an effort to recruit students, he visited 20 Catholic-sponsored and government-run intermediate schools located between Nakuru and Pukat in what was then the Diocese of Eldoret, an expansive territory covering a huge swath of southwestern Kenya's Rift Valley region. As McDonald later recounted in the school's magazine, The Patrician, student recruitment was not an easy task for a new unknown school lacking in resources and funding. As he related, quote, he remembered walking into one school in the Kuru and being asked the surprising question, how do you expect up to us to sign up for your school when the headmaster hasn't even got a car? Despite these limits, as one of a, only a few secondary schools for African boys, in the region, the inaugural class consisted of 30 students from Kikuyu, Nandi, Okusu, Marikwet, and Keo communities. According to Andrew Chimueno, a founding student from Marikwet, St. Patrick's drew on existing connections with local Catholic schools for recruitment and served as a meeting place for Kenyans from a range of backgrounds. Chimueno told me in an interview two years ago that the students, as he said, were from different parts of Kenya. We were five from Marikwet, and then there were some from Tambach, and then there were five Kos. You know, according to Chimueno, we have quite a number of tribes in Kenya, but we met there at St. Patrick's. We went there because of the Catholic influence and also because of the grades we got. There were other secondary schools like Capsibet and Shewayet, but they were very far away. I was almost 20 years old when I entered, almost the same age as the teachers. We had not had such an experience before of getting to know different tribes in Kenya. Another student, Joseph Chesserum, described the inaugural class in a similar fashion, characterizing both the religious networks that define the school's recruitment and the wide ranging mix of students that made up the school's early community. Philip Tunoy, another member of the founding class who would later become a lawyer and a Kenyan Supreme Court justice, arrived through similar networks, coming to the school from Etin Intermediate, where Father Aidan Serlis had been one of his teachers. While memories of the school's diverse character were common among early students and teachers, St. Patrick's appeared at a time when Kenya was emerging from a decade of anti-colonial rebellion and civil conflict known popularly as Ma Mau, which had pitted the largely Kukuyu Land and Freedom Army against British colonial forces and their African supporters. Although the Land and Freedom Army played a key role in speeding Kenya's independence, Feelings of bitterness and tension stemming from the war remained for decades. At the same time, long-standing grievances linked to colonial land policies in which the colony's white settler population confiscated the best and most productive farmlands and relegated Africans to less productive reserves manifested themselves in competing demands over who would benefit from land reform schemes. As Kenya neared independence in the early 1960s, tensions related to these questions resonated throughout Kenyan communities, especially in the Rift Valley, where, the grievances, where these grievances found expression along ethnic lines and where issues related to land resonated deeply. For a school like St. Patrick's, located on the edge of, of the Oshingashu Plateau and pulling many of its early students from various communities located in the Rift Valley, these tensions were present from the beginning. As Chimueno recall, recalled, Quote, St. Patrick's was a strange environment and we met strange faces, especially the Kukuyus, because when we met them, that was about the time we got our independence. So they were threatening us saying, quote, you will have to learn our language. And one of them was taking a handful of soil and saying, this is our soil, we fought for it. In addition, conflicts emerged early on between students and the Irish Kiltegan priests charged with running the school and teaching the first classes. 
One such incident occurred in the months just after the school's opening that involved an altercation between a student named Francis Latoto and an unnamed Kiltegan priest. According to Chemueno, the incident grew out of a lack of instructional training on the part of the priest. Chemueno told me that, quote, we were being taught math, and the problem was that the priest who was teaching maths was not a trained teacher, so he would not follow a professional way of teaching. He would go to the board and the book was in front of him without even introducing the math topics first. So the priest called Francis Latoto, who was from West Pocot. He was told to go to the board and then, and then show how to get the sum. He didn't know how to do it because he had not been taught the way it was supposed to be done. I think the priest was a bit annoyed. So he kind of said, wait, wait, niem jingo tu, which is kiswa hili for you are a fool. So Francis turned around and moved toward the priest. And then he boxed the priest on the face. Then he held the priest. You know, Francis was a huge man. He wanted to crush the priest's head. He picked him up and then we talked the language. You know, our languages are similar between Marikwet and Pakat. We said, don't do that. So he turned and put him down. It was terrible, Chimueno said. Other challenges emerged in these early years. In October 1961, only eight months after opening, the Kiltegan fathers handed over administration to a group of three Irish patrician brothers, members of a group whose vocation was the religious and literary education of youth. While the Kiltegans retained a presence in St. Patrick's for decades, it was hoped that the brothers would bring important teaching and administrative experience. However, hopes for an easy transition and a well-trained and experienced group of brothers did not materialize. While two of the three arrived in Kenya with teaching experience, they were all young in their mid to late 20s, and none had received any missionary or language training prior to their arrival. Pascal McGee, who took over the school's headmaster position, was described by one of his colleagues as being, quote, completely unfit for the job in the country, his main problem being that he could not go in, take a class, and teach. Problems stemming from this lack of training manifested quickly. In February of 1962, just one year after opening, the 60 or so students who made up the St. Patrick student body went on strike, refusing to eat or attend their courses. Headmaster McGee believed that the strike was rooted in student discontent over the daily breakfast of uji or millet porridge. According to Joseph Chesserum, who by that point had been appointed to a position as a student prefect, McGee tried to assuage the students by appealing to a perceived sense of African manhood, telling them that, quote, as men of Africa, they were expected to act in a respectful and disobedient manner. Yet, as Andrew Chamueno described, the genesis of the, of the strike lay in a difference in expectations over the school's science training. The cause of the strike, according to Chamueno, was that the school was still young and the infrastructure was not enough, particularly for the sciences. There was no laboratory. No, so one of the reasons for the strike was the absence of a laboratory because we were being taught science theoretically. And we knew we were going to sit for an exam require, requiring practicals. We refused to go to class because we had been promised that a lab would be built and we were not seeing it coming. Joseph Chesterham had a similar account saying that, quote, the school was offering general science and the students were comparing with other secondary schools. So we demanded to be given better curriculum than what the school was offering. Instead of general science, he said, we wanted biology, chemistry, nakadalika, or other subjects. In addition, Chimueno emphasized the discipline and unified nature of the students' actions, making clear that the reason for the strike lay in student concerns for their academic success. We didn't do any harm, he said, no, no, no. We were very disciplined students. We were all united because each one of us saw the importance of having a lab. We were very disciplined students. School administrators were not patient, however. Shortly after going on strike, students were dismissed and sent home. However, several weeks later, students received a message out of the blue to return to campus and plans were put in motion to improve the school's facilities. As Chesterman remembered, quote, after the strike, the science facilities were improved. We got what we wanted. I think the brothers saw sense in changing some of those facilities. By the end of the year, construction was underway on a new science laboratory. In November 1963, a year and a half after the strike, school inspection reports recorded the existence of a well-equipped science block along with a second one under construction on campus. The St. Patrick's student strike of 1962 is instructive. 
because it demonstrates the ways in which the school's founding generation of students drew on values and ideals such as discipline, student unity, and a belief in the importance of school and academic achievement to pressure school leaders to improve the school's resources. Drawing on these ideas and values, they advocated for what they saw as the necessary resources for their own educational development. Considered from this perspective, the strike is an illustration of what of the ways in which St. Patrick's students began to fashion the spirit of Harambe on the school's campus, even before Kenya's official independence. The 1962 strike, however, was not without its casualties. Francis Latoto, possibly angry still over his classroom altercation from the previous year, decided to leave the school, telling a friend that he would not return as long as those Wazungu or white men were there. According to, two, according to school records, two students were also expelled. In addition, by the end of March, the headmaster, Pascal McGee, had been replaced and sent back to Ireland. In McGee's place, the patrician sent a young brother named Ambrose Hannon to take over the school's administration. Arriving in July of 1962, Hannon took over at a challenging, took over, excuse me, at a challenging time for the fledgling school. In the following years, the school experienced a number of setbacks, including a collapsed roof in the dining hall, a second student strike in 1965, and a constant need for a regular and fresh supply of water. Yet, the mid-1960s also saw the arrival of a diverse group of students and teachers who began to build the school's achievement-oriented culture and academic climate. Hannon himself is credited with organizing the school's first athletic teams. Other brothers, many of them trained in secondary education and coaching, arrived in 1963 and helped improve the quality of the school's curriculum. That same year, the first Kenyan teacher, a biology and Kiswahili instructor named Nicholas Kiptalan, arrived on campus, though he only stayed for one term. By July of 1964, three of the eight teachers on staff were Kenyans, charged with teaching courses in science, math, history, and Kiswahili. They had all been trained in Kenyan universities and teacher colleges. James Tarap, who would later go on to become Kenya's sports commissioner, joined the staff in 1965 and founded the school's field hockey program. Likewise, John Namwamba, a science teacher with a degree from Makerere University in Uganda, became the school's first fully degree-holding Kenyan instructor. Sorry. While early teaching and administrative staff was made up almost exclusively of men, in 1965, Sabina Namwamba, John Namwamba's wife, was also hired as the school's first female Kenyan teacher. Remembered finally by former students and teachers as a top-notch instructor of Kiswahili, the presence of Sabina Namwamba in this early history is important because she was a member of a generation of Kenyan women who filled important socially supported professional roles, such as nurses, teachers, and secretaries, a group that Tabitha Kanogo has described as a female vanguard who began, albeit slightly, to carve out a place for professional women in Kenyan society. While patrician brothers such as Ambrose Hannon made their contributions to the expansion and development of the school during this period, Kenyan teachers and staff such as Nicholas Kiptalan, James Tirap, and John and Sabina Namwamba also helped to infuse the school's teaching core and educational curriculum with the discipline, devotion, and commitment that define this Harambe spirit. In addition, the second half of the 1960s saw the school's physical plant and campus social life grow. A gas-powered generator was added in 1964, staff houses were constructed, trees and flower beds were planted, the campus was expanded with soccer pitches being added and an asphalt basketball court was built in the late, the late 1960s. A school orchestra, band, and a number of student organizations, including a dancing club, a young Christian society, and a discoverers club expanded the school's extracurriculars. However, the most important area of expansion was in the sports arena, where the school's athletes established themselves as leaders in Kenya's emerging sporting culture during the 1960s, notching major achievements in local, national, and international competitions. Locally and nationally, much of this early success came in the areas of athletics, what Americans call track and field, and cross country. In 1964, James Omone won the school's first individual provincial title, a local championship, with a victory in the 440 yards race in the Rift Valley Province Championship. Three years later, St. Patrick's athletes such as Harrison Shikumu, acting as the captain of the Rift Valley Provincial Team, 
help the province win its first boys national schools athletics championship. In cross country, St. Patrick's won the Rift Valley team championship four times between 1967 and 1973. Individually, runners from the school won four of the first 10 Kenyan boys national cross country championships with 1967 champion Paul Chirap repeating in 1969, Kipta Nui Serma winning in 1970, and Richard Kaitan winning in 1976. Others, such as Cosmas Saleh and Raphael Keegan, regularly finished in the top three of national finalists. These local and national successes led to international competitions. In 1970, the school's athletic team was invited to neighboring Uganda to compete against three Ugandan colleges. The Ugandan schools, which included two of that country's most prestigious institutions, St. Louis, St. Leo's College and Teso College, boasted three members of the 1969 Ugandan national team. The trip, the first time a Kenyan school team had competed in Uganda, was imbued with regional and national importance by the Kenyan national media, with the East African standard describing it as a test of, quote, the prestige of Kenya athletics in East Africa. In a dominant performance, the St. Patrick's team won the meet by over 50 points, with St. Patrick's athletes recording first place finishes in, over, in, in no fewer than six different events. In addition, during this period, the late 1960s and early 1970s, a number of St. Patrick athletes went on to garner major transnational achievements after graduation. For example, after finishing school in 1969, two-time cross-country champion Paul Chirap went on to race for the Kenyan prisons team and later competed for Igoji Teachers College. He won a bronze medal for the Kenyan national team in 1974 at a competition in Zanzibar commemorating the 10th anniversary of the 1964 Zanzibar revolution. Mike Murray and Mike Voigt, who graduated from St. Patrick's in 1969 and 1971 respectively, would go on to compete for Masoriat College and Kenyatta College, later on attending universities and competing in the United States as well. In 1972, Voigt and Murray would join former St. Patrick's schoolmate Cosma Sile on the Kenyan men's Olympic team in Munich, where Boyd would win a bronze medal in the 800 meters. The inclusion of Boyd, Murray, and Saleh on the 1972 Olympic team was the start of a tradition that would see a St. Patrick's graduate compete for every Kenyan men's Olympic team until 2004. By the early 1970s, as St. Pat Patrick's was known as one of Kenya's most prestigious athletic programs, and graduates were being recruited for athletic scholarships by a number of American universities. Another sport that the school excelled in, both nationally and internationally, was volleyball. In 1970, the school won Kenya's first ever National Boys Volleyball Schools Championship and went on to win every national title during that decade and half during the 1980s. By the mid-70s, the school was hailed in the national press as, quote, Kenya's top-notch volleyball program. In 1975, they solidified this status, traveling to Uganda, where they won the East African Volleyball Championships at Kampala's Nakivubo Stadium in front of 40,000 onlookers, a crowd that included Idi Amin. The school also had major successes in sports such as field hockey, tennis, and basketball, winning provincial and national titles in all of them during the 1960s and 1970s. One of the most socially resonant of these achievements was a victory by students Patrick Arena and Cornelius Serem in the 1971 Under-15 National Secondary Schools Tennis Doubles Championship. This was the first Kenyan tennis championship won by Africans in a sport historically dominated by the country's European and Asian communities. Throughout the late 1960s and 1970s, St. Patrick's athletes won numerous provincial and national championships and competed in international competitions in a range of sporting events. These achievements made the school and its athletes a central component of what one Daily Nation writer described as, quote, Kenya being internationally acknowledged as a sporting nation, a development that was widely recognized by Kenyans around the country as contributing to the spirit of Harambe. For students, teachers, coaches, and administrators at St. Patrick's, the discipline, hard work, and faith an achievement demonstrated through this early history stands out as an example of what Tom and Boya described in 1961 as the new African dynamism that was set to lay the foundations of the future institutions of Africa. 
Although St. Patrick's opened, opened its doors before the emergence of Harambe as an official national development rhetoric, these institutional foundations were intimately tied to the practice of the values reflected in the spirit underpinning Harambe notions. The nature of Harambe as a malleable concept allowed students, teachers, and staff to pull ideas, values, and practices from a diverse array of sources to create a campus life that contributed to a distinct and exceptional schooling experience. This dynamic in which St. Patrick's was both a product of the nation building context in which it emerged and the confluence of a number of actors with varying backgrounds, interests, and aspirations was the result of the individuals who populated the school's campus, as well as the position St. Patrick's occupied within the Kenyan educational and sporting landscapes of the 1960s and 1970s. The school's distinct early history meant that it drew from a web of local, national, and transnational educational and religious connections that students parlayed into positions of prestige within those very same networks. Though members of the founding generation brought with them expectations that at times conflicted, they created a set of commonly held values that centered notions of discipline, unity, hard work, educational advancement, and a belief in competitive achievement that paralleled many of the values associated with the Harambe spirit. These values allowed them to imagine a future in which they could exercise their own agency and help contribute to the development, to the development of their school and their nation. I look forward to the discussion session here in a second. Any questions anybody has, thank you all for your attention. Um, that's it. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. So please feel free to write your questions on the Q&A section or just raise your hands and you'll be allowed to talk. Okay, so Jonathan. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Dawson, for this nice talk. And uh, good to see you again. I have a number of questions, but I'll ask one for now. Now, this is a case you referenced in your talk uh, about Francis Rotodo and under the strike generally, they are related in a way. Uh, the 1962 mm -hmm. strike at St. Patrick's uh, uh, High School. Mm -hmm. So this is like uh, the teacher, the math teacher uh, who uh, Francis Rotodo struck and wanted like to, with, with his anger was projected to, I think he wasn't a qualified teacher, the methodology was not appropriate, but uh, when he, Francis was not able to do the sum right, he even verbally abused him, calling him Mujinga, you are a fool. Right. I don't know whether this teacher really knew that he's the one who was a fool in this context, uh, but he was pushing it to Lotodo and of course other students. And the school administration, perhaps they knew that they want they, there was need for science, pure sciences, or then there was need for uh, the labs. And maybe that's what the right thing to do because they had no option, they didn't have either the money the, the ability to erect uh, the needed laboratories uh, to teach practicals. But students, all the same, went on strike. And after the strike, the labs were constructed. I think there's a lesson you can take from this, uh, from this small, like not so important instance. And the fact that also that St. Patrick's is named St. Patrick. Uh, we don't know who Patrick is, maybe you can speak to that the relationship between the, the Irish or the Wazungu and the Kenyans through this instance. Uh, what are your takeaways from these uh, specific examples? Uh, thank you, Mwalimu. Uh, th uh, it's very nice to hear your voice um, and I uh, appreciate the, the summary and, and as well as the question, because I think the, um, the, the this question of the relationship between, you know, the the Irish missionaries, you know, and early on they were priests 
after 1962, they were al almost exclusively, although not always, uh, of these patrician brothers, which are two separate orders. Um, and St. Patrick's is, is just named after the Catholic St. Patrick, right? Um, so the patrician brothers, that's uh, an order of, of religious brothers who train, you know, their, their mission is to educate youth in religious and literary education. They have schools all over the world. Um, and so, uh, but this relationship that you kind of ask about, about the, you know, between the early students and these early Irish missionaries, whether we're talking about priests or brothers, I think really kind of gets to the, the core of what I'm, one of the things that I'm trying to emphasize in this paper is that, you know, for those people who know of St. Patrick's and in Kenya, you know, St. Patrick's is not necessarily known by everybody, but it's a relatively well-known institution. Most people at least know of the school's athletic exploits. And many people also know that it's a national school, that it's uh, very successful in academics. It's a prestigious school. Um, and there is this kind of aura about it that students at St. Patrick's follow the rules, you know, that they're disciplined, that they, uh, they in fact, St. Patrick's is famous, although it's, it's not that this has never happened. It's relatively well known around Kenya as being a school where students don't often strike. During the 1970s and 80s, when a lot of students in other places were carrying out strikes, St. Patrick's students oftentimes did not. Um, this has changed a little bit. There was a fire at the school several years ago that some people believe was started by a student. So there are issues at times, but especially in this early period, I think what these two events especially and others show is that, you know, this wasn't just a smooth transition into the creation of a school where everybody just gets along. Similar to nation building as a whole, right? Um, it was a contested process. Um, it was a process where violence was involved. You mentioned in reference to Francis Latoto fight with, um, no, I haven't been told this, but I think the priest that he had a fight with was Aidan Serlis, who was one of the first two, first of one of the, the two uh, Kiltegan priests who was there at the beginning. Um, and uh, who was clearly, according to the oral record that I, I pulled that story from, clearly not trained as a, as a teacher and made mistakes, just pedagogically. Um, disrespectful mistakes. Um, and, and so I think Latota was clearly justified in being upset. Uh, but that and the strike, uh, there was another strike in 1965. Again, that wasn't about curriculum so much as it apparently was about um, uh, student discontent with food uh, and lack of milk. Um, that seems to be a more common theme in, in other schools as well at, at, for striking purposes. Um, but the, I think these things demonstrate that Early on, especially, that relationship was rocky. I think one of the things that contributes to this is that those early students, they were all men. I mean, they were grown men, many of them, you know, in their 20s or late teens, early 20s. All of them had gone through initiation ceremonies in their local communities, whatever those might have been, wherever they came from. Um, they saw themselves and thought of themselves as men. And these priests are coming in about the same age, you know, not much older, maybe three or four years older at most, five years older at most, with little training very little language skills um, and being disrespectful in some of these cases and at worst and at best not really knowing what's going on, which is what happened with Pascal McGee and not understanding the kind of derivatives of the, of the strike. Um, so I think this, uh, uh, it, it demonstrates that, you know, we have the, the people came to the school with a common set of interests and in some cases a common set of goals and aspirations, but those weren't always articulated and they didn't always manifest themselves in the same way. And these students saw themselves going in a different direction at times than some of these priests and early teachers and administrators. And they took the initiative and essentially forced the school to, you know, change things, right? Aiden Serlis, after that uh, um, uh, issue and after the strike, he, him and Pascal McGee were sent back to, to Ireland, right? They, so they were there for less than a year as teachers and administrators. Um, after the strike, again, uh, McGee was removed and they changed leadership. So the students really forced the hand, right, of people who were uh, making those decisions at that early stage. And this is, again, right before independence. So there's clearly um, part of parcel of the larger context of asserting themselves, of uh, challenging power structures, challenging status quo, that kind of stuff, which was, you know, more, I guess, uh, a part of the, the larger historical context at the time. So that's why I think those, those two stories, especially, are very, very important. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the wonderful question. We have a question from Anne. 
thank you for your presentation. Your work adds to the documented history of such boys, schools, Alliance boys, Mangus, Starahere boys, and Maseno school. You stated that after 2004, the boys do not participate in the Kenyan Olympic team. Please discuss why boys from St. Patrick Eton no longer participate in the Olympics. Great. Well, th thank you, Anne, for that question. It was wonderful to see your name and, and, and uh, not hear your voice necessarily, but, but see your question there as well. Um, um, I know it's been a while since we've crossed paths. I've, so far, I've fielded questions from my two uh, Kiswahili teachers. So um, uh, I appreciate you guys coming and, and, and listening and, and giving me some questions. Um, in terms of the, you know, Etin or St. Patrick's athletes participating in the Olympics, one of the reasons is just that um, Kenyan athletics in the last 20 years, since the early 2000s and late 90s, has just become much more competitive, right? So, and this is a result of a lot of things. One of the main reasons is that in the, in the 90s and early 2000s, there was a massive professionalization of distance running around the world. Um, and Kenyan runners, you know, basically took over in many ways um, the, 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 those professional ranks. So it made um, in Kenya the uh, ability to compete or qualify for these national teams for whatever level, whether we're talking about all Africa games, Olympics, world championships, on junior levels, youth levels, you know, senior levels, whatever. It made that much more competitive. Um, I do want to clarify one thing. Um, so there was, there was no Kenyan Olympic team in 1976 and 1980 because they boycotted. Um, so no, no, nobody for Kenya competed in those years. And then in terms of E10, there was a Kenyan at, or E10 uh, athlete that competed for the Olympic team and qualified in 2012. But 2004 was the last, you know, one in the run of unbroken uh, qualifications. There was none in 2008 from E10 at least from St. Patrick's. And then there was another athlete in 2012. And in the last two Olympics, there haven't been any from the school. Now, this gets a little complicated too, because St. Patrick's also has a training camp associated with the school, right? So in Kenya, most athletes train with independent training camps that sometimes associate with schools, but usually run by managers and coaches and sometimes entire you know, corporations that are dedicated specifically to that. Kenya has, or excuse me, uh, St. Patrick's has a training camp that's associated with the school. It's on campus. It is run by a longstanding brother, Brother Colm O'Connell, very famous, well, well, uh, world-renowned distance running coach who's been at St. Patrick's since the 1970s. Um, he runs the camp. So there are athletes that go and train at the camp, and they train during, like, the holidays when school is out or some of the professional athletes actually live there at the camp. It's on campus. It's literally next to the school. Um, Many of those athletes from the camp who are not students at the school have qualified for and won medals at the Olympics. So, for example, the most famous uh, uh, um, kind of uh, exemplification of that is David Rudisha. David Rudisha, who won, um, you know, gold medal in 2012 and 2016, the world record holder in the 800 meters. He trained at St. Patrick's camp, but he was never a student at the school. And so, especially since that camp was founded, it was founded in the late 80s. Um, a number of athletes that have trained at the camp but haven't gone to the school uh, have gone on to win medals um, uh, for, for Kenya. In fact, my tally is that out of all the medals won at major international and continental sporting competitions, including things like the Olympics, the all Africa Games, uh, World Championships, cross country, track and field, all of it. If you total all that up for Kenya and then chart how many athletes have either gone to St. Patrick's or come out of the training program at St. Patrick's that have won medals, it's about one out of five, right? So one out of five roughly athletes that have won medals at major international competitions for Kenya have been either students at St. Patrick's or trained at the camp at St. Patrick's. So, I mean, that's a massive, massive uh, imprint, footprint of St. Patrick's on Kenyan athletics. Um, but yeah, that, that string is only because Athletics has just gotten more com competitive in Kenya. At least that, that's my take. But thank you for the question. There is a question from Sophia in the chat. We see education and sports go hand in hand. In hand. Was there ever any access in this field to women during this time? 
Yeah, so, um, you know, St. Patrick's is an all-boys school, and so, you know, any, uh, um, clearly, the, the, this, this study, of, study of, of this school is focusing on the experiences of the boys and the men that they became. Um, you know, Kenyan education, especially in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, um, when, you know, the, the, the nation was going through the buildup of the expansion of education through Harambe development, Harambe schools, and also, you know, government-funded schools, um, the uh, proportion of uh, uh, girls and uh, high school, secondary school uh, students, uh, young women who were enrolled in schools compared to boys and uh, high school students was about one to two. So in other words, two, tw twice as many boys generally enrolled than girls. This clearly, you know, is a, a, a legacy of a lot of the uh, uh, limitations placed on education for Kenyans, especially for women under colonial, uh, uh, the colonial system. Um, so even when things expanded, and I mean, they massively expanded in the 60s and 70s, like 10, 15 fold in terms of the number of students enrolled, even after 10 or 15 years of that, by the early 70s and into the 70s and 80s, the, the proportion of enrolled students was may, uh, massively out of balance in favor of, of boys um, and to the detriment of girls and, and young women. Um, one of the things I do find interesting, though, at St. Patrick's and, you know, other schools probably can find examples is that if you pay attention enough, you know, you do see the role of women uh, in, in, in the school's history. Um, so Sabina Namwamba is one example. She is somebody that stands out to me because she was, again, the first Kenyan woman to be hired as a full time teacher there. She spent three years there as a full time teacher and taught Kiswahili and the students that had her, the people that worked with her continuously said that she was the best Swahili teacher on campus for those three years. Uh, a lot of her, so several of her sons later on went to the school. The Namwamba name is very uh, well known in St. Patrick's history and in that region as well, especially um, near Kitale, um, very influential uh, in, in politics and just the local communities and stuff as well. Um, so she's one example. And then there are others later on that come down the line in St. Patrick's history um, there were even a few times, a few limited instances in which girl students were enrolled at St. Patrick's for a semester or for two semesters as kind of like uh, visiting students. Um, one thing too, I think is important with St. Patrick's is that there's a in near Itin in the, 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 the community of Singore, which is just down the road from Itin in this part of Kenya. There's another, there's a private Irish run or Irish founded rather, um, Catholic school, an all-girls school called Singore Girls. And Singore Girls was founded in 1967. And it was basically like a sister school of St. Patrick's. So there was a lot of interaction between the schools. A lot of times the athletes for, for, for Singore would train with the athletes for St. Patrick's. Um, they would do a lot of uh, uh, extracurriculars together. Students from these two schools would date each other, um, you know, uh, surreptitiously oftentimes. They weren't supposed to, but they would. Um, they would do dances organized between the schools. Um, so, you know, there's a clear separation, at least in this point in, in Kenyan history, um, between, you know, male and female, girl and boy education in many cases. We see that at St. Patrick's. But there are places where those, you know, boys and girls, men and women, athletes in whatever, you know, uh, age group we're talking about, where they do intersect. Um, and women like Sabina Namwamba, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, another woman named Agnes Wamakonjo, who comes on as a teacher later in the 70s, um, are Matt are, are, are remembered fondly by former students and, and, and uh, administrators and their colleagues because of their ability to be very good teachers and be essentially the only women on campus. There were also cases, um, this might be too far afield for, for talking about right now because it goes into a different time period, but there were also cases of sexual assaults on campus towards women, especially uh, uh, um, students, visiting students, and even cases, reported cases of sexual harassment towards female students um, by uh, older students, older male, stu uh, not by female students, by female teachers, excuse me, um, uh, by uh, older students and staff. So that, you know, is part and parcel of, of part of this as well, um, which demonstrates the kind of vulnerability of being a woman teacher or a, a girl student at an all boys school. Yeah. Jonathan has a question. Why did you focus on St. Patrick's School and this 1961-1962 period in your study? What lessons can today's high schools in Kenya learn from St. Patrick's School of the 60s and 70s? So, I mean, the reason why I, I focused on this is because I have a 
personal background as a high school teacher. I was a high school teacher for 10 years before doing this, you know, coming to do, do research, coming to graduate school. I also coached distance running. Um, I played sports my entire life. I played, you know, I, I ran track and played basketball in high school, played basketball in college. So like the connection between education and sports has just always been natural for me. It's just been part of my life. Um, so when I realized that there hadn't been any real in-depth uh, research on St. Patrick's, it was kind of like that was a no-brainer for me in terms of what I really wanted to do. Um, and I knew a little bit about the school beforehand, but there really is, hasn't been a lot of research on the school, specifically detailed research. There's a lot of like journalism reporting and there's documentaries you can find and stuff, but no real academic research, um, in-depth research on the history. Um, so that's my personal connection um, with the school. And also I went to a, sc I went to a high school you know, this didn't, you know, this is more just kind of coincidence. I went to a high school very similar to St. Patrick's. I went to an all boys Catholic high school that had a major emphasis on sports here in the U.S. And so I see a lot of, that was run by also a, a group of brothers. So I see a lot of similarities in that, that way. Um, now that I'm, uh, I, I know what St. Patrick's is about a little bit. Um, in terms of why focusing on that period of 60, in this presentation of 60, you know, one to 72, um, you know, my, the, the dissertation, my entire project is, the goal is, and what I'm working through now is um, doing a history of the school from 1961, when it was founded all the way until as close to today as I can get. Um, so uh, uh, the, the, the larger project is the entire period of the school, but this period from 61 to 72 is distinct in the school's history because it goes from the founding of the school um, until the beginning of the addition of an A-level program. And I didn't talk about that in this, this presentation today, but in 1973, the school started admitting A-level students, right? And for those, those of, of, of you who are not necessarily familiar with Kenyan education, right, the A-level is just an advanced level of secondary school, like an upper level equivalent to maybe, you know, last year of high school in the U.S. or first year of college or something like that. Um, and so, um, and, and St. Patrick's becomes known around the country for its prestigious A-level uh, curriculum, especially in art and science and math. So there was an A-level program there from 1973 until the end of the 80s. In the end of the 80s, the Kenyan government got rid of A-level and went to a different curriculum model. Um, but St. Patrick's becomes famous around the country for its academic, not just its sporting prestige, but its academic prestige through the A-level. So that postdates this period. And I wanted to really focus on like this founding period, right? Where we see this distinct identity developing at St. Patrick's among the people, at least that went there, when they talk about it, when you go back and read the documentation, student magazines, the school documents, uh, when you listen to people talk about that period, even people that didn't go to St. Patrick's who grew up in E10 during that period, they all talk about St. Patrick's as, as bringing something to E10 that wasn't there before, some cases, these things were challenging, right? Like things like the strike and things like, you know, uh, conflict and contention. Other cases, they were really productive, things like sports um, and this emphasis on competitive achievement and, and prestige are productive, at least for the, the students there. Um, so that's why the period is there. In terms of learning, I'm hesitant as an educator and especially as, as a historian to say that current educators or current schools should take lessons from, you know, educational models that are 50 years in the past or something, um, or sports models, really. Um, I, I don't know that the current context of education in Kenya or other places even is the same as what it was in the 60s and 70s when St. Patrick's really had a lot of its successes. Um, you know, the, the curriculum is different, totally structured. In fact, they just changed it just, just a year ago, right? And they went from having an A-level in the 70s and 80s to having an 844 system where you don't have an A-level and now they've gone to a, a more convoluted complex curriculum system organized in a different way. Um, and so I don't think the comparison is the same from a structural standpoint. Also, there are so many more prestigious high schools that have been founded in the last 10, 15, 20 years in Kenya. You also have international influences like the uh, the bridge academies which are you know part of a large globalized influence of, of uh, technology technology based education which has a major imprint in Kenya so I don't know that there's comparison a readily available comparison in terms of the details I will say that I do believe based on my study of the school and talking 
to people that went there and looking at the documents and, and, and looking at the evidence, I do believe strongly that one of the, the, the main reason why St. Patrick's had the success that it had in the context that it was in was because students and teachers, both Kenyan teachers and international teachers, um, and, and, but, but most of the students, they came to the school with a distinct sense of wanting to achieve things, right? Now, there's something to be said, I think, for what this says about education as a whole. In order to have competitive achievement, you also have to have people that lose. And this is not just the case for sports, but it's also the case for testing. It's also the case for who gets into these schools. It's also the case for who goes to university and all that kind of stuff. The Kenyan education and sports model is both of them are just completely based on competitive achievement, um, like many education systems and all sports systems, right? That's the core of it. Um, so I think there's something to be said critically about that. But the reason why I think St. Patrick's student athletes and students had so much success especially in the 60s and 70s, is that, that they, they came to the school with that as a focus. They, that's what they wanted to achieve. And we see this in things like the strike early on, right? Before they'd ever been to the school for, for very long. We see this in the sports early on. Um, doesn't mean they introduced all the practices. A lot of the educational sports practices were introduced by foreign teachers um, or by the Kenyan government and stuff like that. But it does mean that the culture and the character of the school in many ways came from a massively diverse group of people from across the country, from, from different Kenyan communities, African communities. And to me, that's really, really important. I don't know what that says about current education, you know, how that could be applied, but that's my big takeaway. Thank you. Vanessa has a question. Uh, the school played the mainstream codes of sport. Was there no desire to practice indigenous cultural games? Could this not also exude the spirit of Harambe? Um, I didn't hear the first half of the question. Could you? So she said the school played the mainstream codes of sport. I'm guessing it was track, basketball. So was there no desire to practice indigenous cultural games? So that's- Yes. So that's, that's a good that question. An example. Yeah, thank you. I the spirit of Harambe. <laughs> Sorry for that. Yeah, um, wonderful question. I am always looking for evidence of indigenous, you know, games or indigenous uh, 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 sport-like practices in Kenya in general in the early 1960s, especially at schools. Um, and I put this question to a few people uh, that I talked to who went to school there in the 60s and almost to a person, they, they almost always said no, um, that the closest that you get to say indigenous practices or indigenous sporting practices or competitive practices at the school itself in this early period are gonna be like tug of war games um, and maybe some wrestling um, and stuff like that, which both of those have you know, uh, uh, histories in indigenous, you know, what we might call sport-like practices, not, not really what we think of as modern competitive sports or current, you know, using the word modern is, is, is problematic here, but like current competitive sports, um, but uh, uh, that they do have certain sport-like characteristics. Um, there was uh, a pretty uh, vigorous and vibrant um, club that was founded in the 70s. This was an extracurricular club, and I find this really intriguing um, after the period that I talked about today. Uh, so actually probably around at the be beginning around the period that I talked about today uh, in, the, in the 1970s, at the end of the period I talked about today. Um, but it was a, a, club, a dance club that was founded by the students, but outside of the official extracurriculars of the school. So it wasn't an official club. Um, and they used to do this thing on the weekends that they, they all, and this, this, this existed from the 70s all the way into the early 90s. Um, students would uh, take part in something on Saturday evenings they called the bull dance. So B-U-L-L -L dance, bull dance. And what they, the way they described this um, was that they would all get together and they bring, you know, uh, something to play music on and they play popular music, um, both kind of like current contemporary popular music, things that they would hear, like, um, you know, they said they would play James Brown and Bob Marley. Some people like Johnny Cash, like stuff that was popular in that, that time period. Um, and they would also play stuff uh, like Kofi Olamide, who's a 
pop uh, artists from Congo, um, and they play local, uh, you know, Kalenjin style music and, and, and Kenyan, popular Kenyan music as well. Um, uh, Dowdy Kebeka was, was one that was mentioned. Um, and uh, they would dance and they would be, it would be competitive dancing um, and not organized. They wouldn't keep score, but they would be kind of like a dance off or whatever um, you want to call it. Um, and this, you know, dance is historically not just in parts of Kenya and East Africa, but across the continent, I think dance qualifies as um, a, a sport-like activity in many indigenous contexts, um, you know, pre-colonial contexts, um, because it was at times largely competitive. Um, it was uh, uh, clearly physical. Um, it's clearly, uh, uh, um, you know, something that people conceptualize in, in, in similar ways. So there was that kind of stuff. Um, and there was also a, a competition that the school would sponsor students to go to um, a traditional dance competition um, that they would go and compete against other schools um, at times. And that was mostly in the 70s, again, after the period I talked about. Um, but no, I, I honestly, I, I've, I've been hoping to uncover something somewhere in some oral testimony or, or some record you know, referencing specific examples of indigenous traditional you know sporting practices at at St. Patrick's um, you know done whether it was officially sport official sporting practices or things that just students did in their own time but I haven't found much other than the dance group the bull dance uh, which again they didn't really con they didn't explain it to me the way they recounted it wasn't really like as a sport it was mostly something they did for fun which can be a sport um, but uh, a little bit different I think. Thank you. Jonathan, you want to talk? Yeah, uh, thanks, Dustin, to your respond to that question. Uh, yeah, it's uh, given that the kind of education, the school system in Kenya, from introduced by colonialists and missionaries like the Catholics, uh, you wouldn't expect that, uh, uh, the Western uh, system to accommodate any indigenous. Uh, an indigenous kind of sports. And if they were, actually what I we see is that they promoted their own education, uh, their own uh, uh, sports. This is not a bad thing, uh, but maybe they couldn't, uh, there are so many, just from the religious point of view, actually not even educational. I think there are a number of things which were indigenous way of life uh, of the Africans, uh, which were downplayed, which were, uh, which were like covered and replaced mm -hmm. by the uh, Western uh, equivalents. So I think sporting, education, education system, uh, attitudes and the values, uh, there are quite a number. Uh, the examples are many, but I just wanted to throw a comment in there. Uh, mm -hmm. th those might not be facts, but that's my thinking. Yeah, and let me just say, uh, add to that. So absolutely. I mean, so one of the things too, you know, in many what we call, you know, we might call indigenous African sporting practices, there wasn't a clear, de clear delineation between it being a secular or spiritual practice. Across most African contexts, prior to colonial introduction of sports, um, sport-like activities had spiritual components. So again, you know, for a Catholic missionary school, which is promoting Catholicism, and, you know, this is 19, the 1960s, clearly from the perspective of some missionary uh, uh, religious people who don't really understand what's going on in the ground, like don't speak the language, don't really understand what students want on campus, you know, like we, like we kind of demonstrated a little bit. Um, they, uh, that makes perfect sense that they wouldn't encourage indigenous sporting practices because oftentimes those were associated with religious and spiritual practices as well. Um, we see this with language and this happens at St. Patrick's. Um, in the 60s and 70s, students remember the brothers and the fathers early on using this thing that they refer to as the disc, which was essentially kind of a, they described it to me as a, uh, um, a wooden disc that was, had a string or a rope around it. And if students on campus were caught during the school day, speaking their local vernacular languages, right? Kikuyu or Keo or whatever Kalenjin sub-language they, 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 they spoke in their local communities or whatever, they would be punished and they would have to wear this disc 
as a symbol of like somebody, you know, somebody who got caught where speaking their their uh, community language. Um, this wasn't the case for English and Kiswahili. Students were encouraged to speak English and Swahili on campus because those were the those were the two languages that were part of the curriculum. They had Swahili classes and instructional uh, stuff was done in English. So yeah, I mean, I think that fits with all a, a whole host of what we might call, you know, indigenous or non-Western practices at the school. Distinctly Western, you know, focus in terms of the structure, the goal of education, how it was done, the pedagogy, and the introduction of sports, right? The specific sports that were pursued. So yeah, um, that, you know, and I think that may speak to your original question of the relationship between early missionaries there at St. Patrick's and the Kenyan students is, um, you know, the missionaries, those, that early group especially, saw themselves as coming in and changing these students, forming them to be a certain type of person, um, you know, and uh, students resisted that at times and also followed along at times, right, especially with the adoption of sports. They wholeheartedly adopted sporting practices that were introduced by these missionaries. Any more questions or comments? Okay, looks like there is one. I think there's somebody who in the Vanessa in the question and answer asks, does this not make the case for the reintroduction of indigenous sport-like practices in post-colonial society? I mean, I, I'm all for it, you know, I mean, from a, ped, uh, a, a curriculum standpoint, pedagogically, um, you know, and there are some in some instances in Kenya in which uh, indigenous, what we might call, you know, indigenous sporting practices or, or something similar to that have been um, maybe, you know, I want to pick the right term here, have been, I don't want to say commodified, but have been captured in a certain way and applied to a more kind of uh, contemporary sporting model. So one example is something that's developed in the last couple of years called the Maasai Games. And this was is something that's promoted by first by conservationists in the uh, Maasai Mara in southern Kenya, which was uh, instituted in order to encourage Maasai youth who were going through their initiation practices to not go out and uh, kill lions and uh, wildlife, which is historically part of some of their initiation practices. Apparently. And the Maasai games are um, uh, supposed to be feats of warrior strength, you know, being able to throw a spear or shoot a bow and arrow or wrestle or whatever. But instead of, you know, uh, going out and doing that in, in killing wildlife or doing that in the reserve in some way that conservationists deem to be anti-environmentalist, they've turned these things, the, the, these practices into what, like an Olympics where they give medals, right? So the person that throws a spear the furthest gets a gold medal or whatever. I don't know, I don't think that that's, you know, the introduction of colonial practices, I think it's kind of like uh, 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 capturing it in order to still make African sporting practices in the model of Western sporting practices. Um, but I do think that there is something to be said for introducing, you know, uh, uh, indigenous sporting practices back for those people who still are familiar with them. They will be different than what they were in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s. You know, we're 70 years in, in, into the in, in, of history has passed, but um, I think I think I'm all for it. I just just as much as I'm for the use of vernacular languages to a certain degree, um, as much as possible in uh, in education in Kenya or in in other parts of the world where local languages are oftentimes marginalized. Same same type of thing. Yeah, I think it'd be comp complex to do, but there's no reason why complex things shouldn't be uh, approached in education. Education is complex. That's the purpose of it. So. If there are no more questions and comments, thank you so much, uh, Dalton. This was a very interesting talk. We learned a lot. And thank you to the audience for coming and asking questions. We'll see you next Thursday. Yes. I want to just say thank you, too, for all the comments and questions. I enjoyed it. Um, I hope to see all of you who uh, uh, I know who came face to face some point in the future, near future, hopefully, Zoom willing. <laughs> Zoom willing. Okay, thank you. Bye, everybody.